welcome everyone. It's 4.30 on a Friday, so that means it's time for party games. Everyone up, please. Okay, this is one of my kids' favourite games. It's called Snap. When you see two pictures the same, you yell out snap. You don't beat up your brother next to you. When you see two pictures that aren't the same, you sit down. Okay, pretty easy. Let's go. Perfect. You guys are onto this. Okay, let's go again. Geniuses. Absolute geniuses. So good at this. Oh, man. Winning. Ooh. Walking, cycling, active travel, same. Bit, no, okay, not. Stand up again. Let's try it once more. Ooh. Scooters, bikes, micro mobility, are they the same? It's a bit of, bit of undecision. Okay, the majority think they're not the same. So why do we plan and design our roads and streets as if they are? Now, I think part of it is because some of it's new. So we sort of hang it on to something that we already know. Now, I'm an engineer, so I use systems, frameworks, spreadsheets, all the things planners hate. And that's my way of organising and sorting stuff out. So when I see a new piece of mobility, I fit it into this mobility spectrum. This isn't academic, this comes out of my brain. So the mobility spectrum, according to Mary, at one end, we have stuff that is human controlled and human powered, walking, etc. By the time we get to the middle of my spectrum, it's still human controlled, but it starts to become mechanically powered. And by the time I get to the fun end of the spectrum, people are no longer in the picture when it comes to controlling this stuff, and we're definitely using lots of mechanical power to get it going. So at the other end, we've got the connected automated vehicles, the sort of stuff we'd talk about at an, at an aviation conference, Sydney Metro, fast rail. We're at the other end of the spectrum. People powered, people controlled. And this stuff's really good. We've been talking about it all day. It's pretty cheap, it's pretty accessible. Even the infrastructure's pretty cheap to build. It's healthy. Compared to the other end of the spectrum, those vehicles are really, really hard to build. Ask some of my engineering friends. And the infrastructure is really, really expensive too. However, the behaviour is really easy to predict for and it's really easy to control. Vehicles go forwards and backwards. They go at different speeds, you can often control it, and they are also really talkative. They throw lots of data and information back to you in real time, and then you can operate in real time too. Back at the other end of the spectrum, the behaviour of people is really hard to predict and control. People go forwards, they stop, they scratch, they go backwards. They don't walk at the same pace. They're not really good at giving you lots of data and information. And even when you give them data and information back, they don't always do what you tell them. So one end of the spectrum, active travel. Micromobility is sort of sitting in that middle. It's straying into that mechanical control. So we're starting to get a mixture of stuff there. We're starting to get a bit of data and information back. We're starting to get a bit of control but we've also got lots of human decisions being made. Which is why with micromobility, it's really important to understand who the people are, what ages they are, what journeys they're making, how confident they feel. So how do we design roads and streets for all these different vehicles and for all these different people making all these different journeys? In Australia, we quite often use a movement and place framework, hence the banner. Um, and movement in place is really, really simple. It just says our roads and streets have two purposes. They're there to facilitate our journeys and transport networks. They're also public spaces and places in their own rights. Um, different street environments have a different balance of those two roles, and they do it in a different scale as well. And we use that idea to produce guidance for different ways of moving around the city, and we also use it as guidance for how to provide and design for that street environment. We've got quite a bit of cycling guidance, but we don't have much for micro-mobility. So, to use this approach, how would we do it? We'd ask the simple movement and place questions. People, who rides, why they ride, how safe it is. Place, where they park, how they charge, information and payment, 
and movement, how fast, who they ride with, ride data. Lots of smart people in this room will tell you all those answers. And this picture is like James's picture. I will defend it until the hilt tonight in the pub, but please do not look too carefully. But it is using those questions, that systematic approach, to start to design what features we need, what street environments we need, and importantly, where we need it to design for micro-mobility. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I just have the one slide today, but I'll just be talking about a model called CycleRap. So I'm from the International Road Assessment Program, we're otherwise known as IRAP. We do, well, we have um, safety assessment models. These have been used in over 100 countries worldwide already. And um, probably to James's point earlier, uh, they predict the fatalities and serious injuries that will happen over a 20-year period on roads subject to the design. And they do this for vehicle occupants, but also for motorcyclists, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. So um, I, just, I, I actually just wanted to kick off by saying it's so nice to be at a conference where there are so many women and hear so many women speak about micromobility and cycling and, and um, active travel because um, women really benefit from micromobility. Um, the way we travel is a bit different. We're more likely to use public transport. We're more likely to walk to that. We're more likely to have several stops on the way to schools and so forth. Safety is absolutely critical for women's participation. Look anywhere in the world, Netherlands, uh, Copenhagen, where you have safe infrastructure, you have uh, over 50% of trips being taken by women. Um, one of the biggest issues we have in the space is the lack of data. Um, we know that there are lots and lots of hospitalizations that happen because of, of bicycling crashes, but we don't have the crash statistics. So when uh, traffic engineers look at dangerous places and they're getting police reports, that is missing. It doesn't matter where it is. It could be Netherlands, could be Denmark, could be any other country. The bicycle crashes are missing from the data and the micromobility crashes because no one calls the police when people come off their bikes for whatever reason it is, um, except for when they're hit by a vehicle, but any other reason, whether they fall into a canal or whether something else happens, um, they call an ambulance if it's really severe and that person gets taken off the hospital. Uh, there's no crash reports. And so when we talk about trying to improve safety of the infrastructure, it is extremely hard because of this lack of, lack of data. So what we try and do is fill that gap and we try and do it through um, a, a methodological approach where you can assess the safety of networks. And to do this, we've created a new model which is specific to bicycles and micromobility because they do have quite unique needs. And there are more issues out there than just getting hit by a vehicle. There are some really dangerous uh, bicycle uh, infrastructure and other paths and streets and so forth. Um, and we've got to be able to understand um, good design, safe design, and we've got to start putting the tools into the hands of the, the road designers to help them do this where there's a real lack of design guidance or, or where there's a lack of crash data. In the last few years, there's been a real change in riding patterns. We know even in Sydney here, you see so many more people riding at night. Often they're food delivery. So we've had a change in industry. We've had COVID happen. There's so many changes afoot. And so a model like this, it's, it's kind of one piece of the pie, if you like, but it's a really critical one. Um, and what it does is its, its sweet spot is network assessment. So it's, it's sort of it sits between that sort of really high level examination of a, a cycling network and the, the really detailed street level design. So the idea is that you're understanding safety across the network for all different kinds of infrastructure. It can be used anywhere. Um, it does four crash types. So uh, vehicle bicycle crashes, which is really important, but other ones as well, the single bicycle crashes, uh, the bicycle and pedestrian conflicts and the, the, um, the conflicts between bicycles and micromobility. And when I'm using the word bicycles, I'm also referring to, to other, for other types of light mobility that are, that are using the, the infrastructure. What it does for each is it gives a risk score and all of the risk scores and the evidence that goes into this is based on 
research and studies. And we know that uh, compared to vehicle crashes, the research isn't as good, but we have done our level best and it's all documented. If you scan the QR code, you, it'll take you to the website. You can see the methodological fact sheet, which has all of the research captured there that's, that's then captured in, in this model. Um, so, and this can be used in terms of before and after assessments. It can be used for designs um, to understand the safety and to improve those as well. It's great for assessing things like pop-ups as well. It just gives you that bit more of evidence there. The other thing it does is collect a lot of data. So beyond the scores, you end up with a wealth of data about your, your cycling facilities and what they look like. So this is a tool. I would encourage you to have a look at it. And as I said, it's one piece of the pie in terms of all the things that's needed to bring together together to bring really good active mobility infrastructure to a city, but it's a really important one. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, skip my intro slide, but that's okay. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, so, just so I can get into the meat of it as quickly as possible, I'm starting off with the assumption that students walking and cycling to school is a good thing. Uh, the issue is that not enough students currently do that. And in order to better understand some of the barriers that are faced, my local government area recently did uh, surveys of parents uh, just to understand why they aren't letting their children walk and cycle to school. and. Really, there was just a common theme uh, among the responses that the, one of the main issues is traffic around the school gate. Um, unfortunately, this creates a vicious cycle where there's too much traffic to walk or ride safely, which then leads parents to drive their children to school, which then makes it less safe for other students to walk and ride. And today, I want to talk about a simple intervention that reduces traffic at the school gate, which is a modal filter. So this is just a device that's used to restrict car movements while still allowing all walking and cycling movements. Once you start looking for these, you'll see them everywhere. Some of the best cycling streets in Melbourne owe their success to modal filters. And these are just some examples of uh, modal filters in front of uh, schools in Melbourne. So. They can range from being as simple as bollards that are unlocked at the end of the day to allow for parking, uh, through to curb extensions with gardens, all the way through to a school actually saying, we no longer have enough space, we need to expand into the road reserve and take that over for school use during the day and community use out of the, that time. And really there are a number of different sort of permutations, designs, layouts, um, it's definitely not a case of a one-size-fits-all solution. The idea really is to look at the local street network and to figure out the best solution. Um, and so these really just meant to be examples of, of really what is possible and what I've found so far, including, um, you know, I've heard that other people like diagonal filters, they're also my favourite going round. And this can even happen in quite unlikely situations. So going back through old maps to find these, I um, came across this road that was a connector road in 1966. And then within 10 years, actually had a modal filter put on it and is now a filtered school street. And, um, but you know, as most of us know from bitter experience, it, you know, change is hard, you know, the status quo is quite a fierce enemy and sometimes it's really hard to make the case for change because people can't experience the benefits. Uh, this is really just an overview of those benefits. Um, I can go through them at the pub later. Uh, but one of the ways that we've talked about today to get people to experience what's possible is to use trials. So again, Marybeck Council in Melbourne has, has been trialling uh, open streets. So these are streets that are open for walking and cycling and closed to cars at the start and end of the school day. These have been hugely successful and have massive support from parents and residents. And really with that support, the idea is to expand the program. I mean, not speaking for council, this is what I would do. Um, but you, know, you could uh, then take it a step further and put in an experimental closure. So in Victoria, local governments are able to do this um, where they can close off a section of street to cars 
and um, monitor, evaluate, and see what happens with that change. The idea being that once it is put in place, people can really experience the benefits for themselves, and you can take that forward to a permanent design. So the image on the right actually shows a current proposal for a park in front of a school. At the moment, there's just bollards and you know a blank road, uh, but the council is putting forward this design that still incorporates a cycling path through it and you know has a really huge amount of space that can be given over to greenery and shade and trees and really giving that space back to the community so they can gather and play there and I think it's really beautiful and we should put them everywhere. Thank you. Green one? Yeah? Great. Um, I'm here to talk to you about how we're using AI to study the roads. So first of all, talk to you about uh, what we call airs. There's no sound? All right, well, basically what we're doing Including is road user classification and counts, path tracking, and road user speed assessments. AIRS classifies nine different types of road users and can be used to provide accurate volume and directional counts, organised by type, time, and movement patterns. AIRS tracks a road user's start point, end point, and depicts user pathways. The data can be displayed in many useful ways, allowing the user to understand the whole road and all movements within it. It can identify and analyse complex or abnormal paths, such as moving from a road to a bike path. AIRS can also provide the approximate speed of each individual road user. This is suitable for congestion detection and typical road user behaviour. AIRS has proven to be a highly reliable and completely secure platform to provide richer data for informed decision making. Contact Bicycle Network for more information. All right, so um, the question is how are we using AIRS? Um, and I think it's really important to understand where micromobility users are positioning themselves on the road. So I'll just show you a couple uh, studies we've done recently. So this is in the um, city of Port Phillip. So let's say you're where the uh, white truck is and you want to make a right turn. So with this, we can see some people are com comfortable, oh, sorry, so the pink is um, uh, cyclists. So if you were making a right turn, some people are comfortable from the right lane, but some people might also be turning right using the pedestrian crossing, then using a hook turn. Some people might be using both pedestrian crossings to make a right. So each, each road user has a different confidence with this piece of infrastructure. So AIRS can help you understand how your uh, road is actually being used. Um, this is another one in Port Phillip. Uh, bike lane ends um, here in the, uh, on the left. Um, and then when we put the filter over with um, with cars, you can see where they might interact. So you can hear the you can see that they're getting um, pinched into the side of the of the um, of the curb. So really, what we're what we're using airs for is to tell stories. Um, so here's another example. Um, if you were to look at this new piece of infrastructure. Um, and try to evaluate the sharrows, and then you can see in the um, there's a center median uh, bike lane being put in. So if you were to use traditional methods, you might just put down tubes and say how many people are crossing and using this part of the road. But with airs, you can see exactly where they position themselves on the road with the trace lines. So then we can we can put down digital count lines and really study what part of the road each road user is using. So in this image, um, we've defined the middle position as where the blue lines are, so we put a count line there, and then the left position uh, is in red. So then we can use that to study where they actually position themselves. So is your, are your sharrows working, um, and is the center um, bike lane actually working, or how are people using it? Um, so then, we're also, so in, um, what year was this, 2021, uh, we 
partnered with City of Port Phillip to install uh, these sensors, which if you're interested, there's some downstairs at the expo as well. Uh, they're produced by Vivacity Labs who produced the software. Um, we've got a network of the sensors being put in. Uh, they provide continuous anonymized data, uh, hyperactive, uh, excuse me, hyperaccurate counts. So we're looking at 90 to 95% accuracy um, on all road users. Uh, so vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, micromobility is broken down to a lot of different categories. Um, and then in, was it February, Oscar? When did you get the, this, um, the scooter share? This year, right? Yep, yeah, so we put in um, the, the sensors last year. Now you've got all these new uh, scooters coming into the city. Now you can study them. So um, it's real-time data, um, lots of really interesting analytic tools on the platform, uh, on the dashboard. So if you have any questions, um, pop down uh, to, the, to the booth at the expo. And um, yeah, thank you. Here, which I'll pass along. That's right. If you, you can hand them to have a. Do we have any questions? Oh, Ooh. Mark. They were all great presentations. Thanks so much. Um, a question for you, Sam. That equipment, does it, is it standalone and self-powered, or do you have to wire it into somebody else's infrastructure? Um, so there's two ways that we gather it. The first way where you actually saw the images, that we use uh, long life batteries and a um, telescopic uh, pole with the camera on the top. So that's we could set that up tomorrow. Whereas the sensors, you need a hard wire, you need power 24-7. So you have to work with infrastructure or um, local governments or power companies to get access to the power. Yep. And one down the back. Hi, Mitch here from Space for Cycling Brisbane. Sam, that um, sensing technology you has, is that live? And could you use it to control the traffic light sequences to give bikes a green light? Uh, so the sensors, the 24-7 is real time. And yes, it has networking capabilities. So you'd have to work with um, prioritizing that mode, but yes. Fantastic. Stuart, and then a person in red up the back, and then John Giles down the front. One, two, three. Thank you, everyone. Um, Monica, the IRAP uh, approach, sorry, yeah, IRAP. Um, public sector interest in cycle wrap relative to public sector interest in the sort of IRAP. H have you had much of an appetite? I, I know a lot of modelling goes on with freight and traffic. And cycle wrap seems to underpin the bike approach. So, so where are the governments? Um, where are they at? Yeah, so it, it differs on the level of government. So we, um, the, the star reading models that we've been using for many years now, so they've been developed over 20 years, um, they, they also still assess bicycle safety as well as pedestrian safety. What we find in uh, countries like Australia, for instance, not so much New Zealand, but definitely here, is that these assessments are done on the major corridors where bicycling and, and pedestrian infrastructure is not so much a concern. So they tend to turn off the bicycle and, and pedestrian bits of it, which is a bit annoying um, because there are lots of intersections between your major uh, arterial roads, particularly around urban areas, and pedestrian and cyclist movements. Uh, so we're really trying to push more of that with just the traditional star rating model, but but really we're, we're really putting this out there to cities and the local governments and the municipal governments to for the cycle wrap to really focus on those cycling networks, and that can be done even away from where road infrastructure is. So you're getting a good idea of your the overall safety of your, your bicycling path network, but also your bicycling streets, and even where there are just sidewalks and nothing else. So that's that's the idea of this new model. 
Okay, we've got time for very quickly for one last question. John, down here in the front. Oh, you've got... Oh, so I'm sorry, I apologise. Yours first, yes. Um, I had a question for Liz. Um, with the open streets, you were saying in the um, initial um, phase, I guess, um, having the bollards that are removable, is that done by the schools themselves or is that by traffic people? Uh, yeah, the, the Marybeck, um, the Open Streets program so far has been sort of coordinated by council with schools, so they've had to get traffic management people in. In terms of the longer term uh, view to make that a bit more sustainable, they are training up volunteers to be able to do that traffic management themselves. So, yeah, it will be something that goes forward kind of with the, the school and the community managing it. And very quickly, lucky last, John. Thank you. Uh, it's Jonathan Giles here from Sunshine Coast Council. Um, a question about the cycle wrap. For local governments, um, could you talk a bit more about the inputs and the outputs and in terms of uh, mapping and prioritisation? Sure. So uh, the cycle wrap model is used very much like our other ones where it can be done manually. You, you fit something like a GoPro camera to bicycle head handlebars, uh, you ride the infrastructure, you, you get the images and then you use those images to record what's present and you can do that at sort of every 10 metres or 20 metres depending on your, your um, facilities. Um, that's just put into a, a, a model so once those things are coded um, and then you get out geolocated uh, scores so then you can map those using GIS um, and that shows you where um, the, the risk for those different crash types I mentioned earlier are high but you can also look at things like isolated things like where there are access issues on your bicycle network or where there are severe side hazards on your bicycle network so you can really drill down into that data um, and then of course it, it gives you the the suggested treatments as well to say look you've got a high risk section of bicycle network here and here are the five things that you need to do to improve the safety would you please give a big round of applause for monica mary liz and sam thank you very much